That is a debate that is long overdue and urgent following last week's demoralising spending review, where the Cabinet Secretary attempted to heroically spin cuts that the Tories themselves would be proud of as fiscal prudence, and has just done so again today. But put bluntly, the economic outlook for the next five years is nothing but grim. We often hear warnings of economic uncertainty, and it seems as though not a day goes by without headlines about record fuel prices, record gas and electric bills, and record inflationary pressures. And of course, those pressures all contribute to the economic forecasts we are discussing. But the underlying vulnerabilities of the Scottish economy run far deeper than recent price spikes and the cost of living crisis. So I was dismayed to read the government's amendment to Liz Smith's motion. It can only be described as burying your head in the sand. Rather than address the failures that they have presided over, the Scottish Government have done their usual, point the finger at Whitehall, highlight the failings of the Tories, rightly in that case, but it also attempts to distract from the myriad of failures that they themselves, as a government, have presided over in Scotland. The underlying indicators of economic performance are clear for everyone to see, I'm afraid, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Scottish Fiscal Commission's recent forecasts highlight the stark reality of the challenges facing us all, productivity stalling, real wages falling, and tax receipts significantly lower than previously predicted. It's an economic forecast that many of us have been warning about for a long time, but the Cabinet Secretary has point-blank refused to accept this. Take productivity, for example. The Scottish Fiscal Commission states, and I quote, that productivity growth has stalled in Scotland since 2015. Stalled since 2015. The single biggest important factor in improving prosperity stalled. Seven years of absolutely no progress whatsoever, despite repeated warnings. The Cabinet Secretary can play the blame game all she likes, and the amendment in her name attempts to do just that. But it is abundantly clear that the government have no plan to approve productivity forecasts. We see the same scenario when it comes to average earnings in Scotland. Every single year, for the next five years, Scotland is forecast to lag behind the UK as a whole. It's not a recent phenomenon either. Between 2016 and 2020, earnings in Scotland increased at a slower rate than the rest of the UK. And in recent years, the Fiscal Commission state that the gap has widened, not shortened. And in fact, since 2016, Scotland's average earnings have grown by 21%, which is 5% less than the UK average over the same period. And the picture, happy to give way. John Mason. I thank the member for giving way. I mean, he's very good at listing some of the problems we face. And I don't think anyone's arguing that these are challenges. Can he give us some answers? No. Paul Sweeney. Well, I'm, I'm happy to accept the proposal for a superannuation, given the cost of living crisis. But I have to say that the key proposals are about efficiency of investments, returning on investments. There are huge, endless opportunities to increase revenue and to get public investments raising more money for Scotland. There are innumerable opportunities to outline this. The Scottish Government and councils can be making big, bold moves to aim to be the main supplier of heating to all households and businesses in Scotland instead of multinational utilities through the mass rollout of publicly owned and developed district heat networks. But there's no state entrepreneurship. That's just one example uh, I could give the member to take uh, into consideration. And indeed, in his own constituency of Dalmarnock, where there are district heating schemes that are not being expanded and currently new build housing and social housing is being built with gas boilers fitted into them, introducing and seeding a cost of living crisis in our midst when we could be doing something differently. Deputy Presiding Officer, I don't take any pleasure in pointing out these facts. I want nothing more than for Scotland's economy to be prosperous, thriving and providing a solid foundation for the improvement of people's lives. Of course I do. But the fact of the matter is that it is not. It is, not, it is underperforming and the Scottish Government need to take their share of the blame. Yes, external factors have played a role. Brexit, COVID, global inflationary pressures cannot be ignored. But the problems I've outlined existed well before any of those external factors and have left our economy less resilient in the face of these shocks. And the reality of the, what the poor economic forecasts mean in practice is stark. Last week, the Cabinet Secretary outlined the Scottish Government's spending priorities. Health and Social Security budgets were protected, but everything else was raided. And the Scottish Fiscal Commission say in 2020. 2024 and 2024, 2025, spending in all other areas is expected to fall in real terms 
And in 2025-2026, only the net zero energy and transport portfolios are expected to increase. So there we have it in black and white. Austerity, the very thing the Cabinet Secretary spent the bulk of her speech criticising in withering terms. For the next three years, the budgets afforded to local government, education and skills, the economy and finance, justice and veterans, the Crown Office and Prosecutor, Fiscal Service, net zero energy and transport, external affairs and culture will be hammered, Deputy Presiding Officer, and the consequences couldn't be clearer. Further cuts to local government will see further job losses, drastically reduced services, cuts to education and skills will see the attainment gap widen further and the life chances of our children being sacrificed. Decimated transport budgets resulting in even poorer services, pushing people away from public transport, increasing the costs and subsidy dependence at the exact time when we should be encouraging them back. But perhaps the worst consequence of all is the admission of scathing cuts to the number of public sector jobs in Scotland. The point is perhaps most illustrative of the short-sightedness of this government when it comes to the economy. Rather than investing, retaining, skilling up and increasing the wages of public sector employees, they sack them with the profound personal and financial consequences that decision will have on families across Scotland. It's a symptom of a government run by accountants, not economists. But, Deputy Presiding Officer, it doesn't take an accountant or an economist to see the perilous state the Scottish economy is in. People can feel it in their pockets and in their pay packets every single day. And unless something fundamentally changes, unless the Scottish Government finally takes its head out of the sand, we will continue on this managed decline. And before we know it, we will be too late to reverse the downward spiral we are on. As our amendment today states, Deputy Presiding Officer, the failure to grow Scottish wages will also mean that hard-working people in Scotland are exposed to the pressures of the cost of living crisis. That needs to be at the forefront of our minds. Squabbling about constitutional arrangements, firing figures across the chamber, blaming the Tories, cutting vital budgets won't help ordinary hard-working people, and every one of them needs to be laser-focused on improving their lives in the coming years. All the evidence I've seen so far suggests the government is incapable of uh, pre providing that focus.